Hello, and welcome to this Arts Month Community Conversation. I'm Jonathan Toman with the Cultural Office of the Pikes Peak Region. And today we're excited to bring you Creativity Rush, how forced innovation is keeping the restaurant industry alive. This is the first of eight community conversations that will take place throughout October, and the first within Visual and Culinary Arts Week of Arts Month. These community conversations, curated by local artists and arts leaders, will showcase a variety of topics, both relevant and timely, within various arts sectors of the Pikes Peak region. Today, I'm happy to welcome a, a great moderator and great group of panelists for this conversation. Joining me now is Samantha Wood, owner and chief tasting officer, which sounds yummy, uh, of Rocky Mountain Food Tours uh, and today's moderator. Samantha is an entrepreneur, professional marketer, public speaker, writer, and event planner. Samantha has worked professionally in a variety of industries, including real estate, nonprofit, higher education, and tourism. Her business, as I mentioned, Rocky Mountain Food Tours, which she launched in 2010, has held the number one position on TripAdvisor for food and drink in Colorado Springs for several years running. Samantha has assembled a great trio of panelists who I'll let her introduce. These four will have complete artistic control of the conversation. That said, and without further ado, I'll turn things over to Samantha and we'll get started. Well, thanks, Jonathan. Um, so happy to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to help uncover um, what's going on in the restaurant industry through a few um, local leaders in, and specifically in downtown Colorado Springs. So I've personally gotten to work with these three people over the years through my business and have just admired their businesses and their approach to things. And um, you know, and I think that this past season has really forced people to dig deep and be creative and possibly uncover some new ways to approach their business. So um, I'm going to introduce these these people uh, one by one. We'll start with Russ Ware. Russ is um, a development minded business owner who is focused on the downtown area of Colorado Springs. Um, he is the co-founder of the Wild Goose Meeting House, Good Neighbors Meeting House. with his business partner, Yemi Mobile Aid. Um, his emphasis is on the creation and operation of spaces and experiences that build community and spur economic development um, in a way that really elevates relationships and promotes future growth. Uh, Russ also currently serves on the Business Improvement District Board with the Downtown Partnership. So thank you. Um, next is Meredith Klub. Um, Meredith is the business manager, event coordinator, and part owner of Jack Quinn's Irish Pub and Restaurant, also in downtown Colorado Springs. Um, she is a native of, of native of Colorado and um, went to UCCS. Um, she actually grew up between Colorado and England, which kind of gives her that affinity um, for Irish culture and cuisine, um, and you know why she loves her job. marketing, HR, and event planning for the pub's large banquet space. Um, and she's worked in all aspects of the company and is um, busy implementing new ways to drive business and cost control during this difficult time that we find ourselves in. So thank you, Meredith, for being here. Thank you. Um, and then finally, we have Chef Brother Luck. Um, he is here representing his two restaurants, Four by Brother Luck and Lucky Dumpling. Um, after a a difficult childhood, he found his passion in the culinary arts um, as a teenager. He attended the Art Institute of Phoenix on scholarship where he had a unique opportunity to cook in places around the world, including Japan, Hong Kong, Chicago, and New York. Um, he eventually landed here in Colorado Springs. Thanks, or, uh, we're <laughs> happy for that. Um, and he opened up initially rather like street eats um, during which time he was honored as the best local mm -hmm. chef by the Colorado Springs Independent and most cutting edge restaurant by the Gazette. Um, he's had opportunity to travel and cook extensively throughout Japan and China. Um, and those experiences really gave him the vision and passion to open up for By Brother Luck, um, which features his signature Southwestern style. And then shortly after that, Lucky Dumpling, um, a modern Asian eatery. Um, he's known for campaigning for mental health awareness and has been invited to participate in several uh, television shows, including Food Network's Chopped, 
Food Network's Beat Bobby Flay. Deer and nominated as the James Beard Best Chef semifinalist uh, for the Mountain Region. So thank you, brother, uh, for being here. We really appreciate it. Okay, so to kind of set the stage, um, this year I think took everyone for a loop. Um, I think for me and my business, I had plans that completely were derailed. And um, it has forced us all to kind of think on our feet and figure out what to do with these mandates and these restrictions in place um, that, that have really lasted uh, quite a while as well. So I, I kind of want to start the conversation and take us back to the beginning. You know, we, we almost have to divide 2020 like pre-COVID and post-COVID. It's kind of this like new timeline divider that, that we have. Um, so I want to go back to really the day that um, the statewide mandates were put in place and restaurants and their in-dining facilities were forced to close. Um, and if you remember, that was Monday, March 16th. I remember it vividly because obviously it very significantly impacted my business. Um, but uh, Meredith, I'll, I'll throw this question at you first. What went through your mind that day when the governor uh, mandated the closure of in-dining restaurants and kind of what, what was your initial reaction to that? For us, it just, it could not have been worse timing. The busiest day of our year is always Saturday or not Saturday, but it was always March 17th, which is St. Patrick's Day. Um, so we prepare, we buy tons of food, tons of alcohol to prepare to do about a week and a half's worth of business in one day. Um, the Saturday prior had been the parade. That got canceled. We were still able to be open, so you know it wasn't nearly as, as good as usual. But to be shut down, uh, the other owner and other managers and I were all sitting upstairs just watching Governor Polis, knowing um, because I, that very likely would get shut down. I think he, he did shut it down the day before St. Patrick's Day for a reason because that. I'm sure he saw it as like a very super spreader kind of thing in the Irish bars or you don't even go to Irish bars on St. Patrick's Day, you just go out. Um, so devastation, um, so much product, so much staff on, on deck and wasted. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that was devastating for you guys, especially at the busiest time of the year. Um, brother, what was going through your mind that day? Um, you know, I think the, the, the biggest concern that day was, it was, uh, it was hard because, you know, we had to, we had just told the staff that we were going to be shutting down, uh, because we anticipated it. We had done it that morning and surely an hour later, uh, we got the, uh, we got the message from, from Governor Polis and, uh, yeah, I mean, it was full of emotion. Um, you know, you work so hard and you know, have something taken away from you for nothing, uh, for something that you didn't even do. Um, that was tough. That was really tough. You know, it was, it was probably one of the hardest things I've gone through in my career. Yeah, that's such a good point. And I, I remember being personally frustrated too, feeling like my business was could fail. Um, and it wasn't because I wasn't a good business person or I wasn't doing things right. It was, there were, there were all these external things. And I think that there are points where you really almost had to ask yourself, how much do I love my business? And how much do I love this restaurant? And how much do I really want to do this? And with these kind of things going on, um, did you, did did any of the three of you, um, when we, let's talk about like staffing, um, because obviously there's huge overhead costs with restaurants. Um, at, were you at, at one point in the, the last several months um, forced to furlough or lay off employees? And what was that experience like for you? On St. Patrick's Day, where we normally have, you know, extra staff coming in, um, even the staff that don't normally work here. So we got shut down March 16th. So March 17th, traditionally our best day, fun day, awesome. Uh, we laid off 90% of our employees and it was, 
awful. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, add, and this will uh, echo a little of what Brother just said a minute ago. I We kind of knew it was coming to some extent. So I think we all did. We were watching eagerly to see what would happen. And so we were already, our, our situation is a little bit different being uh, the cafe model that we are. We employ um, a lot of younger folks who, some of whom were already, like we had a couple of employees that were literally headed home to be with their families, uh, you know, uh, somewhere else with the pandemic coming. And so um, for us, it was a, a two-step process and all of my answers are in two parts. One is the wild goose and one is good neighbors. Because at the wild goose, we did end up um, actually ceasing operations. And at that point, uh, then we did have employees that were no longer able to work for us and filed for unemployment. And we went through all that process and helped them with that and, and did all of that. Um, at Good Neighbors, the other spot, um, which was in the neighborhood, we found um, that the the takeaway and um, uh, you know uh, ordering online for pickup and the market component that we added allowed us to keep our staff all working that that wanted to work. So two very different situations, um, but that was very difficult. It was the hardest part of the whole thing. There's no question about it mm -hmm. for us. Now, um, I'm, I'm kind of framing our conversation today. Maybe I should have said this initially, but I'm, I'm somewhat framing this in segments. So I, I want to kind of take us back and somewhat rehash that those uncomfortable things because I think that it helps set the stage of why these, um, why the innovation, why the creativity, why the reframing of success is so important um, because we, we've all had to kind of go through this like, uh, really difficult period of lack of control over our business and lack of knowing what's going to happen. Um, a lot of fear, I think, in a lot of different areas. And, um, you know, somehow we're seven months into this. And I think that we have found ways to work within these new parameters. And, and in some cases actually do really, really well. So so I kind of want to, like I said, I probably should have said this before, but start with what I'm calling, you know, the shutdown um, and the effect that that had on you and your feelings about that and meant for your staff and you as a leader in your organization um, and, and then transitioning into when you had those bright ideas and when you were able to introduce new things and kind of take a step back and say, how do I look at my business differently now with these uh, new restrictions in place, um, and then several months to to deal with this. But was there any point when you thought, "Gosh, I don't know if my restaurant is going to survive this. I don't know if we're actually going to get through it." Um, and you know, did you ever come to that point? Um, and brother, I'll, I'll ask you that question. Yeah, you know, for me, the hardest decision was uh, was you know when it came to the financials. Um, it it be, going through the shutdown really um, showed a, a lot of vulnerabilities in our business. Um, we had to make the decision of you know we've been collecting sales tax money, and and we still have two restaurants with payrolls. Uh, that were due to our staff. We wanted to make sure that we paid our people. So um, that was the first thing that you know my wife and I looked at was how do we pay everyone to ensure that they're getting their checks for the time that they worked. Um, so taking that sales tax money, taking our personal uh, um, expenses, and 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 you know being able to 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 ensure that that was 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 going to happen first. Um, that was the tough decision because then. You start to look at all the payables that you have out there. You know, you have food on the shelves. You you've purchased for heavy weeks. You're anticipating parades. You're anticipating um, holidays, and and you have all this product. Uh, plus, you have credit with with most of your vendors. You know, 15 days or 30 days. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we actually sat down and looked at that, I mean, it was it was a hundred thousand dollars in debt um, with no money coming in. It just it showed how fast all of that could be uh, taken away because you depend on the, the time that you have to be able to sell the product. Um, so that was, that was kind of where, you know, I had to, I had to actually look at our business and say, are we, are we going to survive this? We just laid off hundred percent of our staff. Um, 
we've used our personal money to, to pay everyone. Uh, we've used the sales tax money to pay everyone. We've got $100,000 in bills uh, and we're the personal guarantee. So, you know, to come home and say, hey, we have to inherit this debt, uh, I don't know what just happened. Um, that was that was the shocking part, um, and it took a few days before it was like, no, you know, we're going to dig ourselves out of this uh, one day at a time. And and literally, it was prioritizing, um, getting extremely creative, and and really just grinding through that first thirty days of, you know, let's make sure we sell the product that's on the shelf. Let's 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 just let's just do it. Let's figure it out. Um, and the people that that came up out of the community. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you how emotional I was every day when someone would walk in and just hand us a hundred dollar bill and say, you know, we just want to wish you well. Like that, that would bring me to tears literally in the kitchen. Like that was a really, really that's unique amazing. and challenging time. Wow. That's amazing. And, um, yeah, I, I want to talk about kind of the support from the community too in a second. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, but, you know, Russ, I know that um, I, I do want to talk about good neighbors too, because I think that the where you took that was um, really, really unique. And, and so I do want to talk about that. But just, I guess, in regards to the wild goose, because that was a little bit different. Did you ever have a point in time where you were like, I don't know if we're going to, I don't know if we're going to make it. Did you ever think that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Everything that brother said, same. You know, um, uh, we def we definitely thought that, and and you know, we we went into it. I I remember the beginning of that week when we knew it was coming. Um, I think it was on a Monday that we um, that I started working on getting uh, online ordering implemented for both places, with the goal of having it up and going by the end of the week. And then we found out. That we were going to be shut down and i realized we got to have this up and going by tomorrow and um it was an all-nighter and we got online order and we had never had that before you can't even call in and make an order at our places so we 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 would the only way to get takeout at the goose or good neighbors before covid was to show up and wait for it um so that was a radical uh, thing and then we went into that the very next day going let's see what happens and you know we may as you said get into this in a moment but we had both places open under this new format for a couple of days, and it was very obvious within 48 hours that the goose uh, was not going to fly, no pun intended. Um, downtown was a ghost town. Um, it just wasn't going to work, and Good Neighbors was a totally different story. Yeah. Yeah. Meredith, how about you? What, did you guys ever talk about Jack Quinn's closing, and what did that conversation look like for you guys? We didn't talk about closing, but it's it's just so it's day by day. I mean, as I mentioned, we were shut down the day before St. Patrick's Day, our biggest day. We still are paying off invoices um, to our alcohol vendors to try to get that paid off. We're all COD still. It's it's just week by week still. I mean, obviously it's improved with the dine-in, but um, like brothers at our staff for the priority, you know, because you had to pay them for the two weeks prior and um, just, and so we paid our staff instead of paying the vendors. And so we're still paying the vendors, but um, it was tough. Um, I don't think, I don't think we're 100% certain like how things are going to go in the future still at this time. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we're, we're almost seven months past that date in March, on March 16th. And as we know, you know, the, um, the, the dining rooms have reopened, which I think has helped, but I don't um, necessarily think everybody is out of, out of the woods here. But I, I definitely think that this is, um, this is a good conversation to have because I think that these stories need to be told and need to be recorded because, um, there are some stories of, I guess, just the determination and the entrepreneurship and that spirit that I, I have seen kind of rise up within leaders of organizations. Um, at first, it was devastating and even debilitating. And then I think there was a point where it seemed like people kind of stepped back and said, OK, this this is what we have to deal with. Now, what are we going to do about it? And 
I, I want to talk, um, brother, you mentioned about just people coming forward and giving you guys money. I didn't know that. That sounds amazing. I know that um, all of you have actually a really strong base of patrons, local patrons um, for all of your establishments. And um, so talk, talk to me a little bit about some of the support, you know, maybe from individuals, but also just the support from the, our city or um, different grants or foundations or, or sources where you felt like you found some assistance, you know, and some hope that, gosh, other people want us to survive, you know, other people want us to continue. Um, so, if, you know, brother, if you could talk a little bit more about that and, and just some of the support that you guys have gotten that have kind of given you hope and, you know, some tangible assistance so some tangible financial resources in a time when you really needed it. Yeah, the um, it, it's been a mixture of, of, of multiple things, um, you know, changing your systems, generating revenue, however you could during the new during the new uh, restrictions, um, but also seeing people that wanted to, to, to have us, you know, continue and be successful um, organizations like Downtown Development Authority. Uh, offered us a grant, which was which was huge. Um, that helped out. Uh, we were a recipient of the James Beard uh, Restaurant Relief Fund, um, so we received another grant through them, uh, which helped out tremendously. And and all of that went towards paying uh, the people that we owed. And and it was pri prioritizing. You know, our small ranchers, our small vendors, uh, our small businesses, the independents uh, were the ones that we paid first, and then we focused on the larger companies. Um, and you know going through the the the, the whole ppp loan um you know which is still so many unknowns and and we have no idea how that's going to play out next year uh when it comes uh time to start paying on those things and um you know really getting into into what the forgiveness actually looks like um that was what allowed us to bring a lot of our staff back on you know i, I think about three weeks into it um i was working myself to the bone uh, my wife was in there helping us out and uh, I had I had one one employee who just he was like, I work for free. I just want to make sure that we we survive. And uh, him and I and, and my wife were, were in there every day. Friends were coming to help wash dishes. Um, it was it was insane. And getting that PPP money uh, allowed us to actually bring a lot of our staff back on. Uh, we had to close four for wasn't a restaurant that was going to make sense to do curbside service. So we moved everything into Lucky Dumpling uh, and we worked out of there for, you know, a good two months before we finally started discussing reopening and how that was going to work. Um, it, was a, it was a really tough time. You guys take it that you got from the community. Um, uh, I, Sir, Samantha, I didn't get all oh, of that. You're cutting in and out I'm on me sorry. a little bit, but um, so Russ, go ahead. That's okay. um, Russ, you can answer. Um, what? Tell tell us about some of the support that you guys got. Um, from the community. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think one of the, one of the biggest things that we realized at both places, as they both took very different approaches to the pandemic, was that we were surviving because of our loyal people. Um, we, more than ever, and I think we, we, we learned some lessons that also apply even outside of COVID, realizing as small local businesses how much our core group of loyal customers really is our backbone. Um, you, we've talked about it like this. Sometimes I think we think we have this customer regular group that's this tight little circle. And then we have this wide circle of everybody else. And what we've discovered through COVID is, no, our loyal core group is like this and then everybody else. Like that core group is so important. And so, yeah, we felt that from our customers in, in so many ways. Um, and then also uh, with uh, the county and the downtown partnership and, and other mechanisms that came through the DDA with uh, support financially, meant is another expression in a different way, but it's still an expression of our community saying, you're valuable, we want you to survive, we're gonna roll up our sleeves. And all of that, of course, was not only encouraging, but ab it, without those things, we would not be here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Meredith, did you want to add anything to that from your perspective? 
Sure, same here. We, uh, we saw the same people every week coming in to support us just because, and they would come in, they talked to me, oh, we just need you to survive this. And, you know, we went down to just, you know, the four, four salary main managers doing everything. Um, you know, they were taking the to-go orders, running the food, helping in the kitchens. So um, I think we all got to know our our core um, fans. You might call it a lot better, but I still see them every week. They're still coming in to support. Um, some of them dine and some of them still just want to do takeout. But um, and then the downtown partnership has just been amazing for us. So I can't thank them enough. So during this time, obviously, I know that it was very discouraging. So talk to me about how you maintained your personal positivity and outlook and how you remained kind of steadfast when you were laying off the laying off people who you didn't want to, you know, who were probably really good employees and loyal to you, but you were forced to in some cases. Um, and then the, the small staff that you maybe did were able to keep on for that time. Um, how, how did you keep them motivated as well and just basically lead your organization through a really tumultuous time? Brother, would you mind answering that? Yeah, um, I was I was extremely vulnerable um, and I used my social media as a platform to do that. I, I, I was very open um, about what we were going through, what we were experiencing, um, as we learned, uh, sharing that, um, helping out other, other small businesses and, and other chefs in, around the country that were trying to navigate through these waters as well. Um, that, that helped me with a lot of my sanity during that time, because it, it constantly reminded me that we weren't, I wasn't in this by myself. Everyone was going through this. Everyone was experiencing, um, the same challenges that I was, and this was a global issue. This wasn't something that was just local. It wasn't just me. Um, so I, I think getting on my platform uh, really allowed me to, to receive feedback from so many amazing people on a consistent basis to keep fighting, to keep pushing, uh, to, to, to be able to, you know, persevere. And uh, that was that was huge for me. Yeah, thank you. Um, Russ, what do you think about that? How did you kind of maintain your positivity and steadfastness through this time? Oh gosh, you know, I, this is a, such a lame answer, but it, that is just the way I'm wired. Like, I don't know any other way to survive. Um, and I, we all, um, you know, walk through these kinds of things differently. And I am, you know, the people that are closest to me can vouch for this. I'm an optimist to a fault. Um, which can sometimes be really annoying to some of my closest friends and family. And, and there are some downsides to it. But the, the, the only way I knew personally to get through this was to um, decide I'm going to work 10 times harder than I've ever worked. And I'm going to be positive and, and, and try to lead this charge for, for our people. And, um, and that's what I did. And I, I appreciated, I was watching what everybody was doing. I, I watched those videos from brother luck and, and I think we all kind of took support from each other in, in what we were doing. Yeah, I did too. I watched brothers' videos. I watched your, you did your your morning updates. Yeah, right? the morning the morning updates. <laughs> I read yeah, those. those are, so those are still I'm I'm stuck with those for the rest of my life. I think every single morning now for the rest of my life I'm going to be getting People up and riding them things. now. I know <laughs> they want to see them. Um, so Meredith, what about you? How did you guys maintain your culture at Jack Quinn's? And, you know, how do you still to this day kind of maintain that culture, even in the midst of, we're not totally out of the woods yet, um, you know, but every day it's like we're kind of gaining, gaining ground. Our entire culture is really our staff. We have so many people that have worked here for 10 years plus and just, Bring, laying them off was difficult, but I think you know, helping them get unemployment quickly, moving that process along so they weren't without money for very long, getting them paid. And then we did get the PPP money and we weren't open for dining, but we brought everyone back and we did team, well, socially distanced mass team work. We do finished bars. 
um, did a lot of maintenance projects and things that really improved the, the pub. Um, and it really showed how much our staff just really loves this place. Um, we're like a family and, and we still are. And it's, that's what makes my day when I come here and I see all my, my staff members that are more like my family. And, and most of them, I think, feel the same way. And then also I agree with Russ. We, uh, I watched and learned from a lot of other restaurants and thought, oh gosh, well, we could try something like that. And um, just being more open to new things, I think, um, and getting people excited, getting our staff excited to try new things. And even if they didn't work, you know, we tried. Yeah, so let's take that and kind of shift gears a little bit from like, the sad, <laughs> depressing, discouraging season that that was. Um, and I want to acknowledge that that that, that was tough. That was really hard. Um, and for you guys to persevere through that really means something about your leadership, about your character. Um, but let's let's kind of move into the innovation part of it and the creativity and what you actually changed. You, you needed to change in your restaurant to remain relevant, to, um, you know, you were reduced to 50% capacity and still are. And there was a survey done by the Colorado Restaurant Association back in June. And they said that 56% of restaurants at that point, that when they surveyed, were considering closing if things didn't drastically improve in three months. So the environment really hasn't changed that much, except for maybe people are a little bit more confident maybe going out um, to some extent. Um, but I think maybe what changed is that people that restaurants had to come up with creative ideas to kind of subsidize that that other 50 percent that you weren't able to do with your normal dining um that that you used to be able to do so um so russ i'm gonna ask you first because what you did with um with good neighbors i think is <clears throat> just really creative and i'd like you to talk a little bit about how you um how you pivoted that that business in such a dramatic way. And I guess at what point did the light bulb kind of go off and you say, okay, our current model actually isn't going to work in this environment. And, and not only do we need to change, but we need to change it drastically. And so just talk about that process, if you could, of how you really made that pivot and then basically almost relaunched a new business within your current business. Well, uh, first of all, I'd say it, it was that. That's what it felt like. It felt like we were starting a new business. And thank goodness that's my favorite thing in the world. Um, so um, it, it, it was uh, very energizing. I would like to say that that really early on, um, we realized what was happening and came up with this strategy. Um, and the fact of the matter is that sometimes necessity is the mother of invention. And um, we started those, those first couple of days um, after dining rooms had been closed with this idea of now we've got this takeout, um, we've got ordering online, let's see how we do at both places. And very early, as I mentioned before, it was clear that downtown was going to be a huge struggle. Conversely, at Good Neighbors, which is embedded in the neighborhood, we realized that it was holding its own. And that's that's not by any kind of great genius on our part. It's really location people were being asked to stay home and there we were in the neighborhood right next to their homes. And so um, the next step of that that fell into place for us was that once we, I mean, two days in, we knew the goose is not gonna be able to be sustainable while we're in this particular phase of this thing. So we shut down the goose that immediately produced a lot of extra inventory we didn't wanna waste. We pushed all that over to good neighbors and just realize, gosh, we should try to sell this, these extra eggs, this extra milk, this extra meat, this extra bread. And lo and behold, uh, we were running a little grocery store impromptu for a couple of days. And two or three days in, we realized, oh, this isn't impromptu. This is what we're going to do. And so we were reaching out to people we knew in the grocery industry left and right, who assured us that, that at our scale, the best thing to do was to work with the vendors we were already dealing with. Um, and obviously we, want, we wanted to overlap with inventory we were already using and it was already on our menu. And by a week later, we were officially essentially running a little corner market in the neighborhood that met a need for the neighborhood, um, which corresponded with our need to, to uh, stay in business. And then, um, 
you know, that fed back into the goose to, to reflect back on the PPP uh, funding that brother mentioned. Um, once we had that, with the lessons we had learned at Good Neighbors, we were able to open Wild Goose much sooner than anticipated. We were only down, I think, just almost four weeks. And then we reopened the Wild Goose under the same model with sort of a market going in the, to go. And it never did in that model as well as Good Neighbors. Um, but it was enough to get our staff back and get working. And then, of course, once we had 50 percent, we were off and going. And I'll tell you an interesting note I'll just add on. At Good Neighbors, the minute we got 50 percent um, dieting usage back, immediately uh, our customers reset to think of us as a restaurant again. And while we continue to have market sales and we've scaled it down, but we continue to have that component, it has become a a very small part of our business right now. Once we got that dining room back, um, people started, you know, in, uh, um, uh, th their their time with us became more oriented to to that again. And of course, at both places, we were incredibly, um, we have the incredible advantage of outdoor space. Um, and again, that's that that's not because we're big geniuses of the pandemic. It's because or. Maybe we were geniuses years ago when we chose these locations, but obviously we didn't know this was coming. Right. So, so you you had a cafe. You turned it into basically a neighborhood mm -hmm. market. Um, did you ever see yourself opening up a grocery? Oh yeah. Store? I mean, I think that's that's the interesting thing is it's always been a thing I've been wanted to do. I mean, we've we've looked at a couple of projects that would have a grocery component. We've been really excited about um, what Stacy and Aubrey were working on with bread and butter. In fact, Stacy's one of the first people I called when I realized, oh my gosh, we're becoming a grocery store. I called her and I said, you know, help, 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 help. And she was very, very helpful um, in, in, in making me feel good about what we were doing. Um, but yeah, we we love it. I, I I wish that we could do it more, but we're we're again, what we have to do through this whole thing, even now, is we we have to be very flexible to what, what are our customers, these people that are supporting us, what are they doing, what do they want? And it became, again, once we went, went back to 50%, it became very clear to us early on, people are comfortable going to, there was a couple of weeks there where no one wanted to go to Safeway, right? They were afraid. And, um, and, and that was part of the, the need that we met. But at this point, everybody's kind of back to their normal routine, which includes, I want to actually go to Good Neighbors and just get a sandwich. And it includes, and then I'm going to go to Safeway um, for my shopping. Now, we're still getting some of that business, but in, but it's not anything like it was in April. April, what, in April, we were a grocery store. Yeah. Um, and you know, and right it, now, in our, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, were you going to say something else? No, that's, that's good. I'm good. Um, what I love about what you just said is that that it it was an idea that you kind of had in the back of your mind, and I think that there, when we talk about this season, there are a lot of negative things that we can talk about. But I think that the positive is that it actually gave you an opportunity to pursue something that maybe you had thought of, but maybe for whatever reason didn't have time or didn't have the resources or didn't see the opportunity. And all of a sudden you were presented with this opportunity of like, I've got this space, I've got this product, we're in this neighborhood. Let's look at all of these things around us that we do have. Um, how can we, you know, fit the needs of, of the people around us? And you did that and it was very successful and people responded to that, I think really, really positively. Um, and I think that was, you know, really exciting about your, pivot. Um, you know, I think the restaurant industry as a whole is very much about an experience. And that's why it's not just about eating. You know, we're not just going to go to a restaurant just to get food because we're there to get an experience. We're there to um, be able to be with friends or um, meet somebody, you know, um, special or, you know, uh, whatever, hair live music or whatever. And I think that the what had happened in this in this time is that restaurants had to actually figure out how do we export our experience. Um, some people came to get the food to go, um, and other people, like you said, Russ, maybe waited until the dining rooms were reopened because they wanted that full experience. But, brother, if you could talk a little bit about 
you know, I know that you guys are really big on experiences at Four by Brother Luck with your the dinners that you provide and the chef's table that you have. And, um, you know, what were ways that you found to creatively kind of export that experience or change that experience or invite people to have a new experience with Four um, over the past few months? Yeah, well, one of the things that we we immediately realized was a lot of our food didn't transport well. Um, you know, the things that we were serving at Lucky, the things that we made it for, uh, it wasn't it wasn't really designed to be to go. So um, we were forced at Lucky to really reevaluate the entire concepts um, as far as menu uh, offerings and and what was going to work, what could hold well as it traveled. Um, so Lucky got a full rewrite. Um, with four, we know that four is based on on an experience. It, it needs to be uh, something that's memorable, and it's it's really about the atmosphere and you know the people that you get to to interact with while you're there uh, beyond the food. And um, that's actually what led us into um, trying to bring something more personal, uh, and that led to online cooking classes. Um, but we didn't want to do like a lot of chefs are doing, um, where it was just it was a you know an instructional type uh cooking class it was it was more real um so i i fell in love watching uh franco another restaurant a local restaurant tour here because uh, he was doing these these cooking videos and these kits he was selling out of the restaurant and i i, I had so many people hit me up saying you should do one you should do one uh so tina and i actually said you know what let's go for it so we started selling kits at the restaurant um people would stop they would pick them up at the, the front door and then i would take one home as well. And uh, my wife would record and narrate as I as I cooked uh, the instructional kit uh, with everyone. And then she would engage with people uh, through the comments. And it was just something that was really fun uh, because many people didn't want to leave uh, the house. And, uh, you know, it's, it's turned into a, a thing that we're still doing. Um, not as much, obviously, with uh, Lucky, you know, reopening and, and having his, its expansion and uh, for being as busy as it is. But um yeah we've uh we've, we've definitely become very resourceful during these times uh, i'm cooking in a lot of houses uh for private groups uh small groups um so you know I, i'm getting that request a lot more uh to where we show up and do, we do a, a tasting in their home um so it's 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 a completely different landscape than it was uh a year ago now brother do you feel like by doing the online cooking classes and by going into people's homes and cooking, do you feel like you've expanded your reach or been able to, you know, I, I guess add more, add more patrons to your restaurant because you've you've added these additional experiences that don't necessarily involve people having to come to, to the physical restaurant. Absolutely, I, I think uh, we've we've gained a, a new type of trust. Uh, with a lot of our a lot of our regulars and a lot of our guests, um, and with the community, you know, th if there's anything I kind of I was I was on this path of, you know, doing so many events and traveling around the country and constantly um, in and out of Colorado Springs that this has actually forced me to stop um, and and reconnect and I, I've enjoyed that the most because I'm seeing that with uh, the experiences that we're providing whether it's online or it's in a, a private residence, um, I'm, I'm getting to, to reconnect with our community, which is something that I'm, I'm really appreciating. Yeah, that's awesome, thank you. Um, now, Meredith, because Jack Quinn's is located on the block that it's located in, um, mm -hmm. you guys have been able to participate in Dine Out Downtown. Um, so yes. could you talk a little bit about what Dine Out Downtown is for people who are unfamiliar and how it's how it's helped you guys kind of get through these past few months it's been wonderful it's it's helped us so much um so uh jack Quinn's is on the block between pike's peak and colorado and it's called restaurant row um is the nickname because um there's very few retail of, on this block it's almost all restaurants so we were fortunate enough um for the dine, uh, downtown partnership to uh, to do this for to work with us for this a lot of the bigger cities were doing it so um what they do on uh, friday and saturday nights is they actually shut down the street um Tejon street 
um, in the evening starting, well, they, they start closing at about two and then um, four of the restaurants on restaurant row, we all um, have like a area out there with stanch temporary stanchions that are out. And so we get to pull out um, additional tables. It actually ends up being 10 additional tables, um, which is pretty close to our capacity downstairs um, at this point. And then, uh, and then they also uh, helped us work with the permit for an additional small patio in front of the USOC, which is cool. But it's amazing. The dine out downtown, people calling all you know, week, I want to eat on the street. I want to be outside. And um, I think right now, a lot of people still don't feel safe going inside. So, and they won't come out, but they will, they will come out for this patio dining. And it's really cool. And it's a really cool vibe down there. With the sun going down, and you've got, you know, four restaurants where everyone's out in the street, but still socially distanced. And it's just, it's been so helpful. Awesome. Um, yeah, I, Down Out Downtown has been amazing. And I think Susan Edmondson and the Downtown Partnership have done a great job to help the local restaurants get the variances that they need and work with the city of Colorado Springs. Um, I think that that has been a game changer for several restaurants. So um, I guess I just wanted to extend it. Oh, oh I what was just going to say they extended it. I was going to say that they extended it um, another month, so it runs through October 24th, and actually they just are working with us with a grant for outdoor improvements, so we can purchase things like heaters or lights or burrito blankets, and then they'll, they'll reimburse us for about half of that. So yeah, I can't thank the Downtown Partnership enough. They've been amazing. Awesome. Um, so, um, brother, you mentioned Franco's cooking classes, which I watched those two, and I love Franco. He's definitely a character. Um, have you guys been inspired by other people in the industry and just thought, wow, that was really creative, um, encouraged by some of the you know changes that people have made, um, either here in Colorado Springs or elsewhere? Um, yeah, just anyone that you thought were really kind of trailblazers in the restaurant world um, during this time. So, brother, I'll, I'll ask you. Um, yeah, the, everyone local was like we said. We all watched each other. We all talked with each other and and found just great inspiration through how they were dealing with um, you know navigating funding and and talking with their loan officers and, and ensuring that we were following the right protocols or you know, protecting ourselves with you know, insurance and, and, and looking at what was, uh, how were we gonna cover if we went onto the, to the street? You know, is, is that technically considered our property anymore? Like there were so many things that I was constantly in, in multiple conversations uh, with um, other chefs that you know, I, was, I was fortunate to sit in um, on, a, on a weekly call that we were having with the James Beard Foundation um, for this mountain region. And uh, just to hear the other chefs of what they were going through, things they were doing, um, you know, someone like Josh Nierenberg uh, over at Grand Junction um, was so innovative with what he was doing with his curbside and, and how he was promoting it. And, uh, you know, I, I loved I loved hearing stuff like that. It was, it was, it gave me the opportunity to really just kind of look at what we were doing and, and how were we inspiring people? What were we doing for them? Um, and then how we were taking care of our staff. Uh, that was another big thing is that, you know, it was more than just money. It was checking on them, bringing them food, uh, you know, letting them come to the restaurant and treating it like a grocery store. Hey, do you need onions? Do you need potatoes? A lot of that stuff was was purchased up. We had a lot of, of toiletries. Um, so, you know, it wasn't the nice Charmin, but hey, we've got <laughs> we've got uh, lots of toilet paper here at the restaurant. So things like that, um, we were able to pick up from a lot of other people. Awesome, thank you. Russ or Meredith, was there any restaurateur or chef or you know business that you were really inspired by during this time that you saw do something just completely out of the box? Um, you know, I, as I said, we were all watching Brother Locke <laughs> for sure. 
Um, I, uh, I think Eric over at Red Gravy um, really made some great innovations and, and, and loved the checking in with him. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I think this this panel you have, and so I, perhaps this is intentional on you guys' part, Samantha, but I, I think of the three of us um, are all three restaurants that are definitely centered around experience in ways that maybe more more so than normal, you know, a brother with truly that culinary experience that is so unique to our city. Um, we are that third space coffee. We are all, we're a meeting house for crying out loud. It's in our name. We're all about gathering people together. We, we don't have the best food in town or whatever. We're doing sandwiches and quesadillas. We get it. It's about gathering. And then Jack Quinn's, you know, it's this wonderful, um, been there a long time. People love it. Irish pub. It's an experience. Um, and so I think, um, all of us together watching how we weather this have been inspiring. We've inspired each other. Um, and um, so, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I completely agree. Um, and you know, what's, what's interesting, even in my industry, I've watched people in the food tour world innovate and do different things and it's been very inspiring, but it doesn't always necessarily mean it's going to work for, for my company or it's going to work for our community um, for several reasons. And um, so it's, it's been kind of an interplay of being inspired, but also figuring out what do, what does my community need and what, what resources do I have to be able to um, reach people in, in the way that really makes sense. And I think that's what all three of you have done in your own unique way. Um, and so I guess I just want to ask the question like, are you out of the woods? Like, where do you feel right now in October? Um, you know, we. Um, where? What are you feeling? Are you feeling hopeful? Are you feeling, um, you know, like this year you're gonna end in the black? Um, kind of. What does the next, you know, few months look for you as we kind of feel like, hopefully, we're toward the end of this season, and 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 maybe you know starting to get back on our feet again. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first with this one. I, you know, because we, and I'm sure we all have, we've talked so much about this. Um, and I think that, um, you know, again, with the caveat that I'm by nature an optimist, but sometimes when it comes to looking at the business, you, you have to, to step aside, be objective. And as optimistic as I'm inclined to be, really look at it at um, the hard realities of the challenges that we face. And I, I would say that we are pleased with how we have weathered this thing so far. We again, have the enormous advantage of these great patios and these big garage doors and it's helped us tremendously. And I cannot imagine being in a better place right now, all things considered, given the circumstances than we are. So I wanna say that first. Secondly, and here's where it gets more sobering, even though that is the case, even though we can't imagine having doing any better, and even though we recognize that because of our patios and doors and other reasons we've done better than others have, we are still very concerned about the winter and how we're gonna finish this year. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what's sobering for me is knowing that others, peers of ours, friends of ours, um, who don't have the big patios, who haven't been able to experience this, probably are not quite in as strong as, of a position as we are, and it's gonna be even harder for them. So I'm very concerned. I'm concerned for us. None of us are out of the woods yet. And I have a greater concern overall for our food and beverage community as we go into this winter that has so many unknowns. So yeah, there's a lot of concern. For sure. Sorry, wah, wah. No, no, I, I, I agree. I think that with the bad weather, I mean, yeah, things are unknown. And I think that it seems like people have tried to make the most of the summer and we've had wonderful weather and the fall has so far has been great weather aside from that crazy snowstorm we got in the beginning of September. Um, so I think it's kind of capitalizing on what we have right now. If we don't know what tomorrow is going to hold, things could get shut down again tomorrow. We we don't we don't know, um, and I guess you know maybe one thing that we've learned is that we are resilient, maybe more than we thought, and we are um, creative and we can think on our feet, you know, in times where it's required of us. So, um, 
So yeah, brother, how do you feel right now, kind of taking the year as a whole where we're at in October and kind of what are your sentiments for, you know, the next few months for your couple of restaurants? Um, I mean, there's definitely a restlessness right now. Um, you know, we talk uh, talk about this a lot with our leadership team is, is constantly being in a defensive mindset. Um, you know, we, we can get comfortable. Uh, we, we need to protect everything uh, that that comes in the door um and that's that's our team that's our our guest uh that's the the dollars that we make um we need to be spending smart uh we have no idea what this winter's going to look like we already know that it's tough to to get through the holidays and you know you're dependent on large parties you're dependent on holiday events you're dependent on um you know being able to fill up your room because it's cold outside so you lose your patio space and uh you know as, as as well as we've been able to rebound the last uh, couple couple weeks and months um we know that that's going to be coming to an end and uh we go into a slower season so um you know for me it's it's just a, a week to week uh being smart uh trying not to try not to just spend um but ensure that we have what we need and uh, you know, when I spend my dollars, I, I try to spend them with local businesses. You know, I, I go to small restaurants that I know the owners. I know um, that they're they're in the same position we are. Yay! That's awesome. That's our mantras: buy local, dine local, shop local. That's pretty much why we, you know, my business exists. Really. So, Meredith, tell me how you guys are feeling over at Quinn's scared um like everyone else we're week to week still um winter is really scary especially with that large outdoor patio for the dine out downtown um it's not going to be feasible um maybe even next weekend i think it's supposed to snow so that's gonna really hurt and then um yeah just taking it week by week we, we're trying to yeah like brother said take care of of our local vendors and making the, the big corporate vendors wait. But um, I would not say that we're comfortable right now. Um, hopeful, yes, but comfortable, no, and scared for the weather, for the winter. I think so many people still don't feel safe dining in. So, and I swear, I, I think I hear every week from some, some vendor, uh, oh, I heard there's going to be another shutdown next week. I just heard that this morning. So, you know, the future is very uncertain as far as that goes, too. We'll see. Yeah, I think what we're in control of is a lot less than maybe what we thought in a way. And um, I think all of you guys are doing the right thing and taking care of your people, taking care of your staff and managing your business the best way you possibly can. Um, I don't very much not, I do not hope for another shutdown. Um, I think it would be possibly even tougher than, than the first time around. Um, but I think that all of you have inspired the local restaurants, other restaurants in Colorado Springs and beyond because you have been resilient and you have continued to fight and you have innovated and created and been able to kind of export your your experience virtually and um, met different needs. Um, and so what, you know, what encouragement would you give other restaurant owners who feel that same sense of fear and that same sense of uncertainty, um, as I'm sure everybody is probably right now in the industry. Um, but what, you know, would you tell other people who feel that same way right now as well? I'll open it up to think, you uh, to answer. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I, I think if there's any advice that I would I would share is, um, you know, continue to uh, continue to be vulnerable. Um, don't assume that the community knows what you're going through. Um, you you have to put the pride aside and uh, you know be honest. R restaurants. And, and restaurateurs, we, we are normally the ones donating. We are the ones that are usually offering services or providing gift cards or, or doing charity events. And it's such a strange position for us to be on the other side of this coin now, where we're the ones that need the assistance. We're the ones that are hoping for the support. So I, I think it's important not to um, 
not to hide that, you know, be, be real, be honest. And I think a lot of people um, who are in good positions or in industries that are thriving right now uh, are willing to step up and help us as well. I, yeah, I agree completely, brother. It's hard, you know, because yeah, like you said, we are the ones donating. I still get donation requests. And it's, you know, it's not feasible at this time, but um, I think seeing the, the guests that have been coming in and talking with them during this whole thing, they want us to survive and they want local to survive. So I think really showcasing that, that you're local, that you're you're struggling a bit, that you need all the support you can get, it's is really beneficial. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know that I have anything significant to add other than um, we need to continue to stick together and pull together as a community and as um, people in the industry. And I think we're going to get through this, um, but it's going to be a challenge. Yeah. <clears throat> well. Um, yeah, I think that you guys have shown that you can, you know, take a curveball as this was. And I guess just take confidence that you guys have weathered the storm. And um, and I think that's what's that to me when I look at this year, um, I see that there has been an opportunity to try new things, to learn new things. Um, people have come together in a way that they haven't before. And I think that it's really evident that people here do care about the local food scene and, and absolutely want it to survive. It adds so much culture and flavor, no pun intended, you know, to our community. And we would not be the same without you guys and, and many, many others. So I'm sure that people will continue to support you guys. Um, through the winter and we'll just hope for, you know, continued improvement in um, in kind of the <laughs> the culture that we're in in terms of the mandates and the restrictions and, and that we're continuing to, to progress in that and uh, find our new sense of normal, you know, whatever whatever that looks like. But I commend all of you for, you know, staying in there and being strong leaders and staying positive, even though I know um, it there's been times when it's been really difficult. So um, yeah, we appreciate working with you. I love taking um, groups to you guys. And I, I'm encouraged that, you know, we're even as a, in tourism, even able to operate, but people are still traveling. Um, there are people who, who still want to have dining experiences. Um, and, and I think that that's great that we can continue to offer that. And um, yeah, so did anybody have any last words? That was probably my last kind of official question, um, but any kind of last parting thoughts about this year or you know, innovation or creativity? Nope. <laughs> well, you guys are awesome. Thank you again for taking the time to, to converse with me today and everybody else who's going to listen to this to really hear about what's gone on in the restaurant world. And I agree, brother, it, we need to be telling our story because people don't know if we don't tell them. And so today was a part of that process of memorializing what has happened in our restaurant scene and, um, you know, continue to move forward together. So thank you guys for being a part of it. Um, Jonathan, I will turn it back over to you. Wow, uh, thank you all. Very powerful conversation. I, I would echo what Samantha said about the character and, and perseverance uh, of, of you guys in the restaurant and culinary community as a whole uh, and how the need for support uh, continues. So my thanks to you, Samantha, uh, and brother Russ and, and Meredith, thank you uh, for joining us uh, this afternoon on, on this conversation. Uh, the next community conversation, Visual Arts as Activism, uh, is next, uh, not next Thursday, it's this Thursday, October 8th at 3.30 p.m. Uh, I hope you'll join us for that. Uh, in the meantime, you can explore more community conversation details and find out other ways to get involved in Arts Month at artsoctober.com. Uh, that's the place that has all the details for that. Uh, thank you all for watching. And remember, during Arts Month, to have one new cultural experience with friends or family during October. And hopefully, at least one of them will be culinary in nature. Appreciate it. Have a good rest of your day. And uh, thanks for joining us on this community conversation.